Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 12063, Advanced Statutory Interpretation and Drafting. This is week seven. The topic for this week is the Acts Interpretation Acts, both state and commonwealth. I will be concentrating on the state legislation and for the most part, I'll invite you to undertake reading in relation to the commonwealth legislation. And while you're doing that, of course, consider the differences between the two pieces of legislation. Whilst um, we're going to provide perhaps greater detail on parts three and eight of the Queensland Act, I'm going to go through most of the Act with you and I'd encourage you to follow along by looking at the legislation, ask questions of course as we proceed and uh, make notes for yourself in relation to any comments that I might make and also any questions that come to your mind, even if you don't ask those questions now, Feel free to um, ask through you crew during the week or to um, make a note and do some private research. So, of course, we have the Acts Interpretation Act, Commonwealth, 1901, and the Queensland version, same name, 1954. Both acts apply in relation to the interpretation of words and provide an opportunity for you to use them as a handbook in terms of mechanisms behind statutory interpretation. However, it is only in the Queensland sphere only one of four key interpretation acts and we're going to deal with those tonight as well. Before we do, just a roundup of you crew. Bearing in mind, of course, that uh, some of the marks for this unit um, come about as a result of participation. Thank you all for joining me this evening. On you crew this week, Siobhan provided some commentary about the events of last week and on cue, Siobhan has joined us. So thank you, John, Siobhan, for joining us. And that was um, a question pertaining to whether there might be statutory interpretation elements associated with the, the muted referral of, um, uh, or the, the proposed referral of Peter Dutton to the High Court to determine his eligibility. Helen um, reminded us, and thank you, Helen, for joining us, that uh, about the brilliant writing of Lord Denning, for example, in Miller and Jackson. Um, and I've reproduced um, part of the commentary there, which is just a wonderful example of how we go about using short sentences, primarily in the active voice, but not always. And um, I should just say that when I talk about short sentences, I don't mean that every sentence you write needs to be short. Um, you do need to create some difference in the flow and um, using some longer sentences is always a good idea. But I make the, the comment generally because if students fall into error, in fact, if anyone falls into error, it's generally because their sentences are too long, not the other way around. Um, so thank you, Helen, for reminding us about that brilliant writing. Adam provided us with a link to a website that helps to train you to change the passive voice to the active voice. And it's a very good website. So if you're not, uh, if you're watching this as a recorded session and you haven't been following the discussions in Ucrew, please do so. Um, please add to that discussion as well. If for whatever reason you're having trouble in accessing Ucrew, please let me know. Uh, I should say just, I'm not sure why this has happened, but in the last week or two, I've had to go in twice. The first time it doesn't take, I go back in the second time it takes. I don't know if anyone else is experiencing that, but if you do have some problems, persistent problems, please let me know and we'll get onto it straight away. I'm going to commence tonight with showing you another resource. Um, now we may have touched on this, but this resource I think is excellent. And it's a resource in relation to the Office of the Parliamentary Queensland Parliamentary Council. This is the information page. So hopefully you're seeing that now. So it's um, www.legislation.qld.gov.au forward slash information. If you haven't looked at this page, I'd urge you to do so. If you have looked at the page, I'd urge you to go back and have, a, have another look, a closer look. There's some excellent material. And the Videos provide some um, excellent material. For example, I had a look at one 
called How Do I Find the Legislative History and Creation History Information About a Principal Bill or Act? Very good basic information. So there's a lot of links there that might be useful. In the past, we've talked about some of these links, the Queensland Legislation Handbook, for example. But other resources, legislative resources, might be of interest to you, particularly in the context of your assessment pieces. So, for example, guidelines for drafting local laws or drafting university statutes um, included there, together with the drafting instructions templates, which I believe that I've shown you in the past. So that's the OPC information page, wealth of material, up to date, very authoritative and um, um, very well written and presented. Now, are there any questions so far? And I'm just going to stop the share. Any questions, comments? Are we all good? Yes, Helen? So, so was that address legislation.queensland.gov.au, OQQC? No, it was um, www.legislation.qld.gov.au yep. yep. forward slash information. No worries. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So the... Um, Legislation Queensland website is administered by the Office of the Queensland Parliamentary Council. Okay, so thank you. All right, no other questions, comments? Well, let's move on. So the prescribed reading this week is Chapter 6 from your excellent textbook, Pearson Geddes. And, of course, it, it is all about the Acts Interpretation Act. We're going to go a little broader than that tonight. So the Acts Interpretation Act does more than help with defining words and phrases. It, if you like, provides a framework. And the central idea, of course, is that provisions need not be repeated across all acts or within, um, uh, even within an act on a number of occasions. So it provides some framework, some guidelines and defines some legislation um, words and phrases that you'll often see. But the Acts Interpretation Act is only one of four key acts. Can anyone tell me what one of, or more of the other three that I have in mind to talk about tonight might be? It's not in the notes. So what of the legislation relates to the interpretation, if you like? Any questions, any uh, comments? Evidence Act, good guess, no, not the one I have in mind. All right, so the, the three others, and I'll deal with these first and then come back to the Acts Interpretation Act, are the Statutory Instruments Act, 1992, the Reprints Act of 1992, and the Legislative Standards Act of 1992. So we'll deal first with the Statutory Instruments Act. We have talked about this legislation previously. It sounds a little dry, but when you think about it in the context of your assessment work, it probably makes a bit more sense. And bear in mind that lawyers generally try to advance their client's position in a number of ways. And one of the basic ways of doing that, for particularly if you're in defence, is to attack the underlying basis upon which a decision has been made. And what that means is that um, we, the one of the first things we do is think about the jurisdictional aspects. Does this person who purports to do something actually have the authority to make it, um, to, to do that? And a wider issue is, well, even if it on its face it appears that they do have the power to make a decision or undertake some action, uh, does the legislation or the subordinate legislation um, have proper basis upon which it is enacted? Um, so we try and attack the, you know, take the legs out as it were, by attacking the legislation or the subordinate legislation. So it, when you think about the Statutory Instruments Act, think about it in the context of trying to represent a client or more immediately, perhaps it may be relevant to your assessment work. So the Statutory Instruments Act 1992 
and hopefully you're following this now. If you're um, looking on, on a computer screen or you, you have it uh, in paper version, deals with the interpretation and prese presentation of statutory instruments. So it defines the type of instruments and sets out what can be legislated by a statutory instrument and it rationalises um, the publication, tabling and disallowance requirements for subordinate legislation. First look at section three, and it says that the act applies to all statutory instruments. Section four talks about displacement of act by contrary intention and says the application of the act may be displaced wholly or partly by a contrary intention appearing in any instrument. So what you need to do is consider this section when you're drafting for example, a statutory instrument. You must clearly displace the application of the Act in any instrument if that is what you intend to do. Section six deals with the meaning of instrument. And this is really simple. An instrument is any document. A meaning of a statutory instrument is in section seven, a little bit more complex. So it's an instrument that satisfies subsections two and three Subsection two says an instrument must be made under an act or another statutory instrument or by subsection three, power conferred by an act or statutory instrument and also under what power conferred by law. So the example there is an instrument made partly under express or implied statutory power or partly under royal prerogative. So it's very broad and in fact, have a look at subsection three and you'll see the extent to which statutory instruments relate. The most common is regulations. So regulations are a statutory instruments, but also order in council, rules, local laws, bylaws, ordinance, subordinate laws, even a statute, proclamation or other instruments. So there's a long list there. Have a look at that. And you'll see then from looking at this material that what we're talking about in the Statutory Instruments Act, in fact, is very broad. Um, just to give an example, the <clears throat> Queensland Building um, Commission uh, rectification policy, the QBCC, is a statutory instrument which must be applied by the tribunal, the QCAT, in reaching its decision. Authority for that is Goldfield Projects against the Queensland Building and Construction Commission, which is 2016, QCAT 362. So if you had, for example, a building dispute problem and you had an argument between your client and a builder, let's say you're acting for the, um, for the, for the, own, the homeowner, um, you're relying upon the QBC rectification policy. It may be that you face an argument as to whether that is in fact a statutory instrument or not. So um, think it about this in a broad sense is really what I'm getting at. And hi, Greg, thanks for joining us this evening. Section nine provides the meaning of subordinate legislation being a statutory rule, um, whether that is, a regular, that is a regulation, rule or bylaw, statutory rule uh, that is of a legislative character, statutory instruments that is declared by subordinate legislation. So have a look at section nine, which talks about the meaning of the um, statutory instruments. Part four goes on in division one to deal with issues to do with modification. And section 14 talks about applicable provisions. Now, this is where it gets a bit strange because a provision of the Acts Interpretation Act mentioned in Schedule 1 applies to statutory instruments or something which is required to be done by a statutory instrument. And if you look at Section 19, it talks about provisions of the Acts Interpretation Act mentioned in Schedule 2 do not apply to a statutory instrument. 
So Schedule 1 is the schedule that links with se Section 14 and it talks about the provisions of the Acts Interpretation Act that apply to statutory instruments and Section 19 talks about, in conjunction with Schedule 2, the provisions of the Acts Interpretation Act that do not apply to statutory instruments. And the reason I'm raising this point is that you may work under the assumption that the Acts Interpretation Act provisions apply generally across, across all legislation, which they do, and also all statutory instruments, which they do but only in part. And specifically, some parts of the Acts Interpretation Act do not apply to statutory instruments. Keep that in mind if you've got a legal argument about the terms of a statutory instrument and you're seeking to rely upon the Acts Interpretation Act in that regard. So the two pieces of legislation working together. Now, does that make any sense or am I moving too quickly? All good? All right, so have a look at sections 14, Schedule 1, and 19, Schedule 2 in that regard. Part 4, Division 3, deals with other provisions applying to statutory instruments. That's sections 20 through to 39A. I'll just highlight a little here. Um, section 20 of the Statutory Instruments Act provides for the presumption of validity. And it says, all conditions and preliminary steps required for the making of a statutory instrument are presumed to be satisfied and performed in the absence of ev evidence to the contrary. It's, if you like, a reverse onus situation. If you want to take on a statutory instrument on the basis that it is um, invalid or all those steps that should have been undertaken to create it uh, have not been proven to be established, the, the, the onus is reversed and you've got, to, you've got to show that they weren't. So it's an interesting provision. And as defence lawyers, one of the first tasks is to decide whether the prosecuting authority um, had lawful authority under legislation or statutory instrument. So if the power is conferred under a statutory instrument, the starting point is that the statutory instrument was validly created you have to prove otherwise. But let's talk about an example. So the example case that deals with section 20 is Moon against Gold Coast City Council, Littleford against Gold Coast City Council. So it was a double headed case. 2009 QPEC, the Queensland Planning and Environment Court at three. Now, <clears throat> I take it people know that Corumban Wildlife Sanctuary. This case relates to proposal to develop for residential use a couple of corners, um, Miller's Corner and Clark's Corner, they called them in the case. The owner of the property was the Wildlife Sanctuary and the Gold Coast City Council granted development approval. Now, Dr. Moon and Mr. Littleford did not like this one bit and challenged the decision to redevelop parts of the sanctuary for residential purposes. Now, the way they did it was, in, was interesting. Dr. Moon argued that the council decision on the development application should be set aside because the planning scheme for the Gold, city of Gold Coast, pursuant to which the applications were assessed, was not valid. So you can see that the planning scheme is a statutory instrument. And Dr. Moon said, the decision made here cannot be lawful because the scheme under which the decision was made was not valid. I hope that makes sense. Council, of course, not, not surprisingly, relied on section 20 and the presumption that all necessary steps and conditions are being complied with. That made it really tough for Dr. Moon because Dr. Moon then had to find evidence and create a case to rebut the presumption. So it's, it's not an irrebuttable presumption, it's a, it's a rebuttable presumption uh, 
but the onus is on the person who wishes to attack the underlying validity of the statutory instrument, and that's what Dr. Moon did. Dr. Moon somehow um, found counsel, had found correspondence between counsel and the chief executive of the Department of Local Government and Planning. And it appears that all necessary steps and conditions were in fact not complied with that led to the creation of the planning scheme. Council then, as its alternate argument, said, well, it's substantially complied with the requirements of the, back then it was the Integrated Planning Act, now the Planning Act, and the scheme should be deemed valid. Her Honour Judge Kingham in the uh, Planning and Environment Court referred to section 20 and made the point that um, all conditions, preliminary steps for the making of the instrument are presumed to have been satisfied and performed in the absence of evidence to the contrary. And in this case, at 48, Her Honour said, I am not satisfied that any of the alleged deficiencies referred to by Dr Moon manifest a failure by the scheme to coordinate and integrate core matters. There was not evidence to the contrary so as to disturb the statutory presumption that council followed proper process. So I guess Her Honour um, adopted a fairly robust approach in that um, if we accept the evidence that uh, not all procedural steps had been complied with, there was sufficient um, evidence to, sat to satisfy the court that um, it was appropriate for the matter to proceed. But it was an interesting argument. And you can see that the argument um, that Dr. Moon sought to promote was a reverse onus and he had to upset the presumption that otherwise existed. Now, Section 20A of the Statutory Instruments Act says that the regulation may be used instead of another type of subordinate legislation. So regulations are the most common form of um, instrument, subordinate legislation, but you might see them in some other guise. And basically this section says that if the, the Act authorises the governor or the governor in council or a minister or an officer of the public service, someone in the executive to make a provision with respect to subordinate legislation, uh, and it doesn't specify what type of subordinate legislation is to be used, or it specifies something other than a regulation, then the governor in council may make uh, may proceed with respect to the matter as a regulation. So it kind of sets regulations at, at the top of the pecking order. So some examples there, if, if an act, and you'll see this in the legislation, if an act provides that provision may be made with respect to a matter by order in council, that provision may now be made by regulation. If a provision has already been made with respect to a matter by order in council, the order in council may be repealed and amended by a regulation. So increasingly, we're not going to see these other forms of statutory instruments, at least not to the same extent. We will increasingly see regulations. And I think that's a great move. So um, I think the introduction of section 20A makes a lot of sense. It simplifies the language because one of the problems with law, I think, is for people looking in. They say, it's so confusing. I don't know what an order in council is. I don't know what a proclamation is. Um, but you say regulation, and it's a bit easier to, to identify, particularly if there's a commonality. Also have a look at a couple of other sections in the Statutory Instruments Act. Section 50, which talks about disallowance. And you'll recall that a disallowance in the context of legislation is where the Legislative Assembly, the lower house, not that we have any, a higher house in Queensland, but the Legislative Assembly Parliament may pass a resolution disallowing subordinate legislation in certain circumstances. Now, the interesting thing about Queensland is this. If the resolution is passed, the subordinate legislation ceases to have effect. Um, it's as if it doesn't have it, if it, it, it as if it didn't happen. But have a look at section fifty-one, because it does provide uh, 
limited saving of operation for subordinate legislation that ceases to have effect. And it says there that the section applies if subordinate legislation ceases to have effect because it was not tabled or because it was disallowed. Subsection 2 says the subordinate legislation is taken never to have been made or approved. However, subsection 2 does not affect anything done or suffered under the legislation before it ceased to have effect. It's really quite an interesting scenario there. So, of course, the idea of subordinate legislation is that rather than Parliament making all these laws, that power is effectively delegated, remember this from introduction to law, to the executive. So the executive make executive um, make subordinate legislation through the form of regulations, but Parliament has this overriding ability to disallow the subordinate legislation if it sees fit to do so, and then it has the effect of making it so it's never the subordinate legislation is taken never to be, have been made. But at the same time, if decisions were made while it was alive, then they stand. So the provision in Queensland is, sorry, in Queensland, upon disallowance, the subordinate legislation is never taken to have been made, but for the fact that anything done or suffered to be done during that time does survive. And that is all I intend to say about the Statutory Instruments Act. Any questions? All good? Let's move on to the second, Reprints Act. This is really quick. The Reprints Act um, deals with the Office of the Queensland Parliamentary Council's responsibility to produce reprints in Queensland legislation. And that's all we need to know about it. So when you see um, the website, you, what you're looking at is, is really reprints. Um, in the old days, it used to be actual copies of paper legislation, but now it's, it's predominantly online. Now, the third piece of legislation is the Legislative Standards Act. This one, I think you should look at for your assessment if you haven't already done so. Has anyone actually looked at the Legislative Standards Act in the process of preparing their assessment work? Is that a yes? Not yet? Not yet? All right. But we will after tonight. Okay. So the Legislative Standards Act says um, that when legislation is prepared, it must be to a high standard. So you need to pay close attention to this act for your assessment work. If you're following on now, have a look at this Legislative Standards Act. Um, we'll start by looking at section three of the act, which deals with the purpose. And the purpose of the act is to ensure that Queensland legislation is of the highest standard. It's effective, it's efficient, um, and it provides information that is readily available. So the purposes are primarily achieved by establishing the office of the Queensland Parliamentary Council. Their functions are set out in section seven. So when you're drafting legislation, you need to be mindful of fundamental legislative principles. And section four of the Legislative Standards Act provides a definitive statement, which you can use effectively as a checklist in this regard. So section four deals with the meaning of fundamental legislative principles. So for the purposes of the Act, fundamental legislative principles are those principles that relate to legislation that underlie a parliamentary democracy. And there's an example. I think the examples are terrific. Um, when I'm reading legislation, I always look at the examples and it helps to clarify the situation. So when you're preparing your material, you might want to think about including an example. So under section seven, a function of the office of the OPC is to advise on the application of fundamental legislative principles to proposed legislation. 
subsection two talks about the principles requiring that legislation has sufficient regard to two things. So the first is the rights and liberties of individuals, and the second, the institution of parliament. Subsection three expands on the second of those issues, uh, sorry, the first of those issues, which is whether legislation has sufficient regard to the rights and liberties of individuals, and then it goes on to list a number of things, like a checklist from your perspective. And subsection four talks about whether a bill has sufficient regard to the institution of parliament, and it depends on a list of three things. So have a look at the Legislative Standards Act, subsection four, or section four rather, in particular, and subsections two, three, and four that work in conjunction with each other. Make sure that you are aware of those provisions and that anything that you draft at least takes into that, takes those matters into account. Now, not everything will be relevant. Uh, and that's fine, but at least you're aware of it and you can look at it. So for example, when we're talking about legislation having sufficient regards to rights and liberties of individuals, then depending on the legislation, you may have to ask yourself whether it has sufficient regard to Aboriginal, traditional and island custom. That's subsection 4.3J. Um, and it might even prompt you to create something extra in your legislation that you hadn't considered. Um, a really good one, a basic one, is that the legislation will have regard to rights and liberties if it provides appropriate protection against self-incrimination. Now, it doesn't always have to. Like, for example, there are specific pieces of legislation in Queensland where the right to self-incrimination is removed, but so you need very specific words if that's what you intend to do. So this is really providing you with guidance, um, but it's not prescriptive in the sense that you must follow these things or follow everything. Have I confused you or is that making sense? All right, so then have a look at subsection four that deals with a bill that's prepared having regard to the Institute of Parliament and then subsection five goes on to talk about subordinate legislation in the context of having regard to the institute of, uh, institution of parliament. All right, and one of the, the key things, of course, is that anyone creating subordinate legislation must ensure that the power um, or the law, the subordinate legislation, is within the power of the act, uh, the authorising law, that allowed the subordinate legislation to come into existence. That's pretty basic. All right, also on the Legislative Standards Act, have a look at part four, which deals with explanatory notes, sections 22 to 25. Now that's gotta be of interest to you in the context of what you're doing. Section 22 talks about explanatory notes and the requirement for them to be tabled with a bill or subordinate legislation. So, when introducing a bill into the Legislative Assembly, a member must circulate to the members the explanatory note. And when the subordinate legislation is tabled to Legislative Assembly, it also must be accompanied by an explanatory note. See section 49 of the Statutory Instruments Act for the requirement to table the subordinate legislation. And again, this is another example of where these four pieces of legislation, three of them in particular, work in conjunction with each other. Section 23 of the Legislative Standards Act deals with the content of the explanatory note for a bill. So this is, again, it's a checklist, but here the wording is different. Whereas section 20, sorry, section four was more permissive in the language, the language used in section 23 is far more directive. An explanatory note for a bill must include the following information about the bill in clear and precise language. So 
of course, anyone looking at any drafting that's done uh, will consider this, and so you should when you're drafting material. So you need a short title, a brief statement of policy objectives, brief statement of the way the policy objectives will be achieved, a brief statement of any reasonable alternative way of achieving the policy statement, why those alternatives were not adopted, and a brief assessment of the administrative cost to government um, for the programs. Now you don't have to worry about costings for your exercise. You can touch it, you can touch on it, but you don't have to. A brief assessment of the consistency of the bill with fundamental legislative principles, which is section four. Or if it's inconsistent with those fundamental legislative principles, for example, if the material that you draft does away with the right against self-incrimination, you must specify the reasons for the inconsistency in your material. A brief statement to the extent to which the consultation was carried out in relation to the bill and a simple explanation of the purpose and intended operation of each clause of the bill. If the explanatory note does not include the information, um, it must state the reason for its non-inclusion. Okay, so section 23 of the Legislative Standards Act is clearly important in the context of the, the work that you're doing in this unit. Any questions, comments? Hope I'm not going too fast, but we're covering a fair bit of material. All good? All right. Section 24 deals with the content of explanatory notes for, exp for subordinate legislation Section 25 says the validity of legislation is not affected by the failure to comply with the part. So the marks that you receive in your assessment will be affected by your failure to comply with this part, but in real life, the legislation does not um, depend upon compliance. Let's look at another case. This case is Bell and another against Beatty and others. You know, can you have a guess who, given this is 2003, Queensland Supreme Court 333 is the citation. Who do you think the defendant Beatty might be and who do you think the others in this case might be? How so, yes, Premier Beatty. Greg got in just in time, just before I was about to announce it. So who do you think the others might be? Government minister. Yep, there was about 19 of them. Yep, other members, says Siobhan. The ministers, says Greg. Ministers in cabinet. So it was the entire cabinet, the Queensland cabinet. So Bill, Mr. Bill said, I'm taking all of you on, went to the Supreme Court. And bear in mind, this is in the context of dealing with the Legislative Standards Act. So in this case, the 19 respondents were the, he is brave. Uh, let's see how it works out for him. Where the Queensland Cabinet, the 12th respondent was the Minister for Primary Industries. I think it might've been Henry Palaszczuk, I'm not sure. Cabinet decided to submit legislation to Queensland Parliament prohibiting primary producers from sending unpasteurised milk or milk products off their property. That was the legislation. That's what Cabinet decided to submit to Parliament. Mr Bell claimed to be a person aggrieved for the purposes of the Judicial Review Act 1991 because he's a consumer he wanted to have access to unpasteurised milk. He believed that it was beneficial in terms of dealing with certain medical conditions which, for which he suffered. So a couple of interesting things there. If you want to challenge something um, which is legislative based, the first thing you need to do is think about the Judicial Review Act. So the idea is that the judiciary review through this act what Parliament has done or purports to do. So the issue in this case was whether the proposed legislation would contravene the public policy requirements 
of the common law, or more particularly for our purposes, the Legislative Standards Act. So remember, of course, that Section 4 of the Legislative Standards Act states the purposes of the Act and it must include fundamental legislative principles and they relate to any legislation um, in a parliamentary democracy based on a rule of law. Subsection or Section 4, Subsection 2 of the Legislative Standards Act states that the principles include a requirement that legislation has sufficient regard to the rights and liberties of individuals and the institution of parliament. Section 4.3, as we've just heard, sets out a number of examples of criteria for determining whether legislation has sufficient rights regard to rights and liberties of individuals. So what did the court say? It came before Justice McKenzie, who said at 24, two things may be said about the Act. This is the Legislative Standards Act. One is that it is not an entrenched piece of legislation. Legislation inconsistent with it may therefore, as a matter of ordinary principle, be passed by Parliament. Remember I said it's something that they, you must consider and you must explain why you're complying with the requirements or you're not, but it's not entrenched. And the second, said Justice McKenzie, is that Section 23 1F of the Act clearly implies that Parliament is not prohibited from considering a bill inconsistent with fundamental legislative principles. All that Parliament is required to do is, is make a statement in the explanatory note for the bill explaining the reasons for the inconsistency with the fundamental legislative principles. In other words, if there's a departure from fundamental legislative principles, the Minister will present the bill to the Legislative Assembly and the idea is that they must bring that, that fact to the notice of the House. Does that make sense? All right, so what, what I'm saying based on this case is you need not slavishly um, ensure that legislation does fit within the um, principles as outlined in the Legislative Standards Act. Excuse me, John, may I ask a question on that point? Uh, John, my question is, Essentially, Mr. Bell was challenging the fact that Cabinet made a decision that had not gone before the rest of the Parliament and that he was seeking for a debate before the Parliament because perhaps he was hoping that rather than Cabinet making a decision, that Parliament would have challenged it and possibly not passed that legislation. Is that the thrust of the argument? No, I think it even goes beyond... I think it's even before that... I think what he, what he was attempting to do, Mr. Bell, was to, for want of a better word, seek an injunction. Now, it wasn't strictly an injunction in any way, but for the sake of the argument, he wanted to stop Cabinet from being able to present this bill to Parliament, to stop it before, before it even went to Parliament, on the basis that that which had been created did not comply with the requirements of the Legislative Standards Act, in that it did not have due regard to the rights and liberties of individuals. Therefore, it should never have gone, it, shouldn't, it should not be allowed to go from Cabinet to Parliament and in Parliament be um, the subject of debate and a vote. Does thank that make you. sense, Greg? Yeah, thank you very much. All right. I'm not sure we'll see too many of those sort of cases, but the point that I'm, I guess I'm trying to make by reference to that case is that when you're preparing an explanatory notes uh, you must consider the Legislative Standards Act, you must consider these fundamental um, rights and liberties of individuals and the institution of Parliament. So I'll be looking for that in, um, in, in assessing your work. All right, we'll move on. I have to, I'm, I'm going to get to the Acts Interpretation Act very soon, but we'll probably have to spill over for next week for most of it. Just a quick reminder, Extrinsic material, of course, we're all very familiar with that. And you remember that that's a large part of the uh, Acts Interpretation Act, Commonwealth and State, which provides for the ability to use extrinsic material in assisting in the interpretation of legislation. So this is my segue into the Acts Interpretation Act. 
Can anyone tell me the section number that deals with extrinsic materials in the Acts Interpretation Act at Queensland? Fourteen B. Yes, that's it. Now, here's a little trick to it. Extrinsic materials are also referred to in the Statutory Instruments Act. So have a look at section 15. And they may be considered in certain circumstances when, in consider when interpreting statute law or statutory instruments. Now, I take it we're all pretty familiar with the idea of when legislation becomes law, we all know that it's upon assent of the Crown, which is the formal acceptance through the Governor General. And we know that in the Queensland Acts Interpretation Act, it provides that if there is no date of commencement built into the legislation, Section 15A um, takes over. And the effective date of the um, Act is the date of assent, unless it's otherwise provided for expressly. But I know that any legislation that you prepare, you will you will deal with that specifically. You won't rely on the, the default position. And we know that um, to determine the date of assent, you need to check legislation Queensland. Can anyone tell me how they go about finding the date of assent for legislation? I've given you a bit of a start, a bit of a hint. How do you find the date of assent? Um, John, sorry, I, I can't answer that, I don't know, but um, just quickly for the assessment then in relation to that question or that issue just raised, we, we have to specify when the when it's going to start in I know that sounds really like duh, but you need like that kind of thing needs to be very clear. Okay. Yes, it should be clear. Yeah. Um or you can simply say uh, the effective date date of the act is the date of assent. Um you know, but but just be clear on that issue. Thank you. Now, in terms of the original question, where do we find the date of assent in legislation already existing? Siobhan says on the front of the document. Yep. Have a look at the legislative history. So if you go on legislation Queensland, go on to acts as passed um, in a year or even uh, enforce legislation. And if you click on legislative history at the bottom of the page, you'll see the date of assent. But usually it's on the front page of the act as well. So there might be a couple of places to look. All right, now let's go to the Acts Interpretation Act. Um, we'll just make a start, but your homework for this week, if you haven't already done so, is to carefully consider all of the Acts Interpretation Act. Now, I know that in statutory interpretation, in the preliminary subject, where you know almost everyone does that, not the advanced subject, we touch on some parts of the Acts Interpretation Act, but we don't deal with the some of the more mechanical parts. So we'll just go through it now. If you've got the Act in front of you, please follow. Section two, the Act applies to all Acts, including it, the own, its own Act, including the Acts Interpretation Act. It also applies in some ways to statutory instruments, but we know now that it doesn't apply to automatically not all sections of the Acts Interpretation Act applies to statutory instruments. That's where we need to see the Statutory Instruments Act, Part 4, Divisions 1 and 2. Acts Interpretation Act Section 4 says um, the Act, the application of the Act may be displaced by contrary intention appearing in the Act. So the specific legislation that you or others might draft can override what's in the Acts Interpretation Act, but you need to be clear um, in that regard. Section 7 says that the Act includes statutory instruments and includes a reference to statutory instruments. Part 3 deals with general provisions applying with Acts. Look at sections 9 to 14D inclusive. Section 9 says the interpretation of an act in relation to Parliament's legislative power. An act 
is to be interpreted as operating to the full extent, but not to exceed Parliament's legislative power and distributively. That's in section nine. What's the, what do we mean by an act is to be interpreted as operating to the full extent, but not exceeding Parliament's legislative power? What's that a reference to? From where does Parliament derive its legislative power? Constitution. Yeah, that's it. So <clears throat> when you, what the Acts Interpretation Act in section nine, subsection 1A is saying is that when you're interpreting legislation, do so by interpreting it to the full extent that power had, uh, the, the, the Parliament had power to make that legislation. What does subsection two mean when it talks about when interpreting legislation uh, it is to be interpreted as operating distributively. What does that mean? Any thoughts? So across the board, yeah, possibly maybe a little bit the other way around. So referring to each individual of a class and not the class collectively. But again, you're looking at the total, but you, you're entitled to break it down. So maybe do some research on that. I, I may stand to be corrected in my, um, because I couldn't find it defined in the legislation. That was my interpretation. Okay, we'll have a look at that. I'm just gonna do one last little case, very short, and that'll do us for this evening. This is Brisbane TV Limited and others against the CJC. 1996 QCA 295. What's the, Q, the, the CJC? Or at least what was it in 1996? The Criminal Justice Commission, now known as the It's triple C, Crime and Corruption Commission. Yeah, that's it. So this case was Brisbane TV against the crime and the CJC. It went before the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal had to consider section 91A of the Acts Interpretation Act. And it said that the purpose of that act is to ensure that Queensland legislation is confined within those limits leaving it to section 9.3 to preserve the application of the enactment to the extent that it would otherwise operate on persons, um, matters or circumstances properly within legislative power. So the court in that instance was simply looking at the extent to which the powers conferred on the CJC um, were available to be conferred. Did parliament have the legislative power to the extent that it did in that case. I won't go into the detail, but it, I'll just cite it as, if you like, a case for general principles. And that's all I propose to do this evening. What I propose to do is start off with some commentary on section 14 of the Acts Interpretation Act Queensland. Now, I'm sorry I don't have time to go through the Commonwealth legislation, but I would urge you to look at that in conjunction, even though I'm not talking about it. It's not to say it's unimportant, quite the opposite, it's very important, but there is a great deal of similarity, of course, between the two uh, interpretation acts. But while you're looking at the two, uh, be mindful of identifying the differences between them. All right, are there any questions, comments? You've been very patient, you've listened very carefully. Thank you for that. All good? All right. Well, we'll see you next week. And uh, please contribute through you, crew. Any questions through you, crew? And we'll see you next week. All the best. Bye then.